Hey there everyone. In this video what we're going to do is actually take a, a walk down memory lane and look at all of the topics and concepts that we've talked about in Stats 1020 Elementary Statistics over the course of the semester. So what this uh, exercise is meant to do is just to kind of remind you about all of the different things that we've looked at and what I would suggest that you do is you have your notebook out and if, if I say something or talk about a particular concept and you say hey I need to go back and review that jot it down real quick uh, and that way you're able to come back to it uh, and go through your notes and, and take a look and, and sort of review uh, whatever it is you need to look at. So um, this is probably going to be a couple of videos so as to not take up you know 30 minutes of time that sort of thing. So we'll probably work through um, chapters one through five in this video and then we'll continue the discussion um, in the next video. So this is the final lesson. So we began um, in chapter one, which introduced us really to the very beginnings of statistics. And so there was a lot of focus on vocabulary, especially in section 1.1, right? Dealing with population, sample, parameters, and statistics, and what all those things mean. So, you know, if you're given a, a scenario and we ask you what's the population, what's the sample, what's the parameter, what's the, what's the statistic, you should be able to identify uh, those things very easily. So remember, parameters describe the population, statistics describe the samples. Okay, so it's really the big uh, takeaway um, from that section. Um, in 1.2, uh, this introduced us to different types of variables. So remember, variables are those characteristics that change from subject to subject, person to person, whatever it is we're trying to study. And so there are many, many different examples of variables. We talked about classifying them um, as qualitative, which are categories or labels, um, and also those that are quantitative, right, that are quantities, measurements, numbers. Um, and then we also had uh, sort of a subcategory within quantitative variables, which are those that are discrete and those that are continuous. And so you should be able to identify a variable as either qualitative or quantitative. Um, and then further, if it is quantitative, whether it's discrete or continuous. Also in chapter one, um, we, we kind of outlined a little bit for you in 1.3 this process of, of statistical study. And, and what I mean by outline is we, we don't really touch the surface of all the detail that goes in with a lot of the research that people do and conduct on a regular day-to-day -day basis um, in specific disciplines. And so really there are four broad steps to this, which number one is determining the design of the study. Uh, that means you gotta come up with a research question Okay, and then once you have your question in mind, you kind of decide on your population, your variables, and then how you're going to collect that data, the sampling method itself. And that leads us into step two, which is actually employing whatever the sampling method is, whether it's a survey uh, or maybe some sort of an experiment, whatever the case may be. Uh, number three, we organize the data. Um, that generally is done with visuals, right, graphs, which we talk about in chapter two. Um, and then number four, there is some analysis of the data, and we get into a little bit of that in chapter three um, and, and moving forward in some of the other sections um, as well. Um, sampling types, we talked about um, three. We've got the random sample, okay, which we use to um, reduce bias. That's why we use randomization. You don't want bias. And then we've got an SRS, which stands for the simple random sample. That's kind of related to the random sample. Um, and then we have convenience samples. And there are some issues that can come up with convenience samples. Um, also in this section, we talked about the randomized comparative experiment, okay, where we've got some sort of random assignment to reduce the bias. We do that to two different groups or three, depending on how sophisticated your experiment is. Each group is then designated as a specific treatment or placebo group. This way there is some sort of control. Um, and then at the very end, we compare the results and we actually see whether or not something occurs. Okay, so the purpose of that placebo um, is to keep things constant or controlled. Um, and we treat the, the participants or the subjects in, in both groups exactly the same so as to reduce any sort of bias that could, could potentially occur. Okay. We do have things called confounding variables, so don't forget to, to take a look at that. So that's something that else that could influence um, the desired outcome, and so as much as possible, we have to control for those. And we've also got something called single-blind and double-blind experiments, and so I'll leave that to you to go and take a look if you forgot what those were. Um, section 1.4, we didn't get into um, in depth. Uh, that was something that I had indicated that you all needed to read on your own. 
um, and it deals with critiquing published studies. And so there's a lot of different vocabulary that you can take a look at there. Some important material. Make sure you take a look, um, at least at the points that are mentioned here. Uh, and if you need to, skim through the summary that's found in the, uh, in the ebook for the course. Okay, but that pretty much rounds out um, chapter one. Now, chapter two switches gears a little bit, and what it says, okay, well, if we've collected our data already, now how do we make sense of it? And so the first thing we looked at in chapter two was frequency distributions, right? So um, frequency distribution shows us the variable, and it shows us how often the variable is taken. So there are counts, okay? We've got some different um, types of uh, distributions in general, frequency distributions, probability distributions, which we looked at. Um, in section 5.1. Um, and then we've got some related vocabulary as it pertains to frequency distributions, namely relative frequency, cumulative uh, frequency, some class boundaries, and these, these limits. So take a look at the um, examples that were presented in section 2.1. Um, the other sections, 2.2, uh, dealt with displaying the graphs, right, or excuse me, displaying the data, rather. Um, we've got categorical variables, and to display those, we use pie charts or bar graphs. And for quantitative variables, you have histograms, stem and leaf plots, and line graphs, okay? These are the only charts that you are responsible for in the course, um, and the only ones to focus on. I know the textbook did a little bit more. That's okay. Um, it's good knowledge for later on or food for thought. Um, but these are the ones that you're responsible for. In addition to scatter plots, don't forget about that, but that's in chapter 12. So we don't talk about it in chapter 2, but while we're talking about graphs, that is another one that you are responsible for. Section 2.3 said, great, you put all the graphs together. Now, what story does it tell us, right? It's the who cares question. And so for this case, we analyze graphs. So that's what section 2.3 um, walked us through, looking for trends, deviations, outliers, and shapes. So some of these uh, graphs we can identify with shapes, namely the histogram and stem and leaf plot, whether or not there is some sort of skew left or right, whether it's uniform um, or symmetrical. And of course, when we make good graphs, we have to make sure to include title, axes, labels, equal increments uh, on the axis or the scale, providing a key. Um, so that's important. And as you know, I deducted points for people who didn't put those things, but um, got to make sure you have those details on there. And the big, big picture, big takeaway here is you got to know your data. Very important. Chapter three said, okay, well, um, we understand the data, you know, in pictures visually. Now, what does it look like numerically? And that's what this uh, chapter focused on. It was really in three areas, measures of center, measures of dispersion, and measures of relative position. So measures of center deals with those um, typical data value. So is there a measurement that we can look at for t something that we would consider to be a typical value? We do. We've got mean, median, and mode. Okay, and I've got some, some annotations there in um, parentheses for you to take a look at. And then the other one we had was weighted mean. And so that was a little different. Something like calculating grades, for example, okay, would be considered that. So we've, we've got some examples with that, when to use them, which measures of center are best to be used, depends on your data. Um, section 3.2 dealt with measures of dispersion. So we've got range, variance, and standard deviation. Remember, there was a long, somewhat formula for the standard deviation. There's a chart method we use to compute. Standard deviation is the average distance. The average distance data values are from the mean, and it deals with spread. Okay, so the larger that standard deviation, the more spread out the data is. Now, people wonder, is that good or is it bad? And the answer to that question is it depends on your data. Okay, sometimes you want a lot of spread, sometimes you don't. Uh, we also introduced very briefly the normal distribution and our good friend, the empirical rule. So make sure you go take a look at the empirical rule. There was a separate um, presentation that I had just on extra examples of the empirical rule. So make sure you're comfortable with those. Um, we also had measures of relative position, okay, or relative standing, uh, kind of dealing with ranks. That's important to know when we describe data. So we've got stuff as percentiles, z-scores, quartiles, um, and we introduce another graph, which is the box and whisker plot. Remember, that's based on the five-number summary, so don't forget to look that up. And something called the inner quartile range, or the IQR. Chapter 4 dealt with everybody's favorite topic, probability. Uh, of course, I'm being sarcastic there. It's not always everybody's favorite uh, topic, but it certainly is one that gives 
some of us some anxiety when we when we think about statistics, right? Probability. So we've got some vocabulary here. Make sure you review that stuff, okay? Especially as it pertains to um, experiment outcome sample space in an event. So we did spend a little bit of time in section four one going through and going over what these words mean and how they're used, okay? So make sure you're you're careful uh, to review that. And of course, probability has rules. And so a lot of these rules um, can be found on your formula sheet. They are summarized there. I'm not going to go through all of them here. I do want to point out the first one, though, dealing with probability is a number between 0 and 1. That's something that people often overlook um, when they're asked to find a probability and they report the answer is like 1.2. Okay, that's impossible. Probability has to be locked between 0 and 1 inclusive. So make sure you keep that in mind as you go through the rest of your rules here as they pertain to complements, uh, when we add or, or multiply probabilities, all of that stuff is very important. A little bit of special effects there with the transitions. Um, don't forget about dependent events, conditional probabilities, all very, very important stuff. And of course, writing out the sample space, you, all, you have um, some tools in your, in your tool chest there, tree diagrams, uh, tables, writing out a systematic list, all things to help you with writing out the um, sample spaces. So make sure you have familiarity with the formula sheet, of course, so you know where things are, are, are located, um, but using um, these formulas are, is, is important, so make sure you remember the context. And there's some, some tidbits here, keywords to look for uh, uh, as you proceed through. And we come to another aspect of Chapter 4, which dealt with counting. So this was Section 4.4. We've got something called the Fundamental Counting Principle and Permutations and Combinations. And so we've got some, some formulas here for you to take a look at. Again, these can be found on the formula sheet as well. Make sure you know when to use these formulas uh, for permutations, when the order actually matters, Okay, some sort of an arrangement, maybe a ranking. And combinations is when the order does not matter. Okay, So make sure you're reviewing those. And then we come to chapter five, um, which is an application here, more so of the probability. We introduce a probability distribution, which is uh, something that shows us the probabilities of respective outcomes, right? Those two things, outcomes and their probabilities. Uh, we've got some rules for probability distributions to be considered valid. There are two, make sure you know those two. Um, and then we've got a formula for what's known as the expected value or the average outcome, right? You take each probability and you multiply by its respective outcome. That's known as a weighted average, okay? And what I've got a question there, it says, what does this really tell us? It's all about the long run outcome, okay? So if this is trial is repeated many, many times, this is what we expect to happen. And of course, you got to remember your units since it is an average, averages do have units. So that is um, the review for chapters one through five. In the next video, we'll pick up uh, with chapter six, which dives into the normal distribution uh, far more in depth and continues our overview.